All right, everyone. Hey, I want to welcome you to New Life, 4th of July weekend. And it is so great to be here with you. It's my privilege to share with you today from the Word of God. And we're going to be in Matthew, the 25th chapter today. This is such a rich piece of scripture, and I believe will change your life. If you came today looking for hope, you're going to find it today in the words of Jesus. Now, this Matthew, the book of Matthew, is actually part of the New Testament. If you're not familiar with the Bible, if someone shared this video with you today, or you just happen to find it online. Uh, the New Testament is the part of the Bible that is descriptive of Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, and his people that we call the church. And we're going to be there. You can find that on your electronic device, Matthew 25. You can Google it, find it in your Bible. In the New Testament, there are some major themes threads that are woven throughout the whole of the New Testament. One of those threads is this. And this is what's applicable to you today and to me today. That there is a God, a living God, the one true living God who has created all things, who sustains all things. And that God is personal. That he wants to have a relationship with you. An intimate, powerful, life-giving, faith-filled, hope-filled relationship with you. That is some good news for today. Because maybe today you came here just looking for a little bit of hope. And my prayer is that you would find that hope today. Not in anything I could give you, but certainly in the words of Jesus Christ. Now, in life, many times we will try to live life in our own strength. I, I know this from experience because I, I've done this trying to live life by our own ingenuity and, 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 and strength. And what we do is we compartmentalize our lives. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. I call it siloing. Siloing. We have different silos or compartments of our lives. When I was younger in Elwood City where I grew up, these people had an enormous barn. If you could picture this. They, they no longer farmed this place, but inside that barn, they built an elaborate climbing wall. And it was really like rock climbing inside this barn. And you could climb all through the inside. It was an amazing place. They had it all lit up. And you could go in there. But the hardest climb in, in this entire barn was in their silo. Inside this old silo that was empty, it was an old brick silo. It was huge. And they built this elaborate set of you know, climbing handholds that you would strain to climb up to the top of this silo. It was, it was amazing. This was huge. And as a younger person, I did it. But I don't know if I'd still do it today. And see, because it, it, it was really hard. And the truth is that life can be that same way. Life can be very hard. And in our lives, we have silos. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. You may have a silo that is your job. It's your career. It could be being a housewife. It could be an executive. You could work out on the highway, a teacher, whatever it is. And that's one of your silos in life. You spend a lot of time there straining to climb up, to do better, you know, to excel at what you do because you have responsibilities and, and you need to do well in your job and you put a lot of energy into it and time into it. But when the time comes and when you punch the time clock, you jump over to another silo, which is your family. And it's very important. And you want to pour into your family and love your family. You want them to love you. And you spend time and you go on vacations and you do all these things with your family. And on the 4th of July weekend, you go out, you picnic, you do whatever with your family. But when Monday comes, you jump back into the job silo again. And you're back and you're, you're climbing that wall. And then you need some time off. You need a break. So you go over to, you know, this kind of this leisure silo and you play golf, you go hunting, whatever it is. You spend time with your girlfriends or whatever. And then you go back to the family again. And then you're back over under the job again. And then on Sunday, you go to church. And it's your, the, the faith part of your life. And you go because you love God. You want to serve God. And you, and you, you go back to the church. And you, maybe you go to Vacation Bible School, which I hope you've signed up for online. And you do that. But then you're right back at work again. You're back in that silo. And you have all these different kind of compartments or silos in your life. And you're, you're, you're like on a treadmill going from thing to thing to thing. To be a follower of Christ is something much more than just kind of being on the hamster wheel of life. To, to be a follower of Christ means this, that Christ is my ultimate pursuit in life. He's not just part of my life. 
The scripture says to live is Christ, that everything else in my life falls under the authority of Jesus Christ. And, and in that, there is this sense of purpose and order and abundance that comes when everything else in life is subordinate to my pursuit of Jesus Christ. In fact, in Matthew, the sixth chapter, it says that if we seek his kingdom, are you seeking his kingdom today? He said, if you seek his kingdom and you seek his righteousness, in other words, if Jesus is your ultimate overarching pursuit in life, then all these other things, all the other priorities in life are gonna be given to you as well. There's a balance and a joy. It doesn't mean life is gonna be perfect, but when Jesus Christ is our ultimate purpose in life, there's a balance that comes to the other areas of our life. When our highest motivation in life, listen to me now, is to honor him and please him and follow him and love him, you're gonna see that he adds blessings into every other area of your life. And once again, I'm telling you that life is not gonna be perfect. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and you may have life to the full. Actually, C.S. Lewis said this, if you look for yourself, in other words, if you are the highest priority in your own life, if your life is all about you, if you look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But if you look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. There's a wholeness of life that comes when Jesus Christ is our ultimate purpose in life. And I don't know what you came looking for here today. Maybe you came looking for just a little bit of hope, a little bit of joy in these trying times. Maybe today you came looking for a sense of courage to be able to continue to move forward. You will find in Jesus Christ a strength and a hope, and I believe an abundance that you cannot find anywhere else. There is a God who has created and sustains all things. And that God wants a relationship with you that is life-giving, that relationship that we have through Jesus Christ. Now today, I want us today to listen to the words of Jesus. Because when you listen to the words of Jesus, it'll change your life, all right? And when Jesus taught, if you went in the first century to hear Jesus teach, usually the Bible tells us that when he spoke to crowds of people, there came a point in his ministry where he always spoke in parables. Parables. All right, that's not a word we use an awful lot in, in modern language. But the root word of the word parable is the word compare. A parable is a story that demonstrates something about the kingdom of God and God himself. It's a story from everyday life that shows us what God looks like, who he is, and, and what his kingdom is like. All right, so, and Jesus taught this way over and over and over again. Now, I want you to understand, as we read this story, the people who are listening to this did not have the opportunities that you and I have. They did not live in the United States of America. They were not in the land of the free and the home of the brave. They did not have a chance to pull them up by themselves up by their bootstraps and have the, the, the opportunities that, that you and I, the educational opportunities, the professional opportunities that, that most of, many of us have. Whatever you were born into at the time of Jesus, that's pretty much gonna be your lot in life. If you were born into royalty, you're probably gonna die royalty. If you're born into poverty, you're probably gonna live in poverty. If you're born a peasant, you're probably gonna die a peasant. All right, they did not have the opportunities, and yet Jesus presents to them a story of blessing. Jesus presents them a story where, where the God of heaven is giving gifts to people who need so much the blessings of God. And I think this is so relevant for you and me. This is actually what it says in Matthew 25 in verse 14. It says this. This is Jesus speaking now. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man. Now I want you to see in this parable that the man represents Christ. The man is him and he's traveling to a far country and he called his own servants and he delivered his goods to them. And to one, he gave five talents. Now talents are really coins, valuable gold or silver coins. To one, he gave five talents. It's a lot of resource, a lot of money. He gives it to this guy. To another, two. And to another, one. And to each according to his own ability 
And immediately he goes on a journey. So this guy comes, he represents Jesus. He comes and he gives these people a blessing. He gives them opportunity. He gives them these talents. And then immediately he, he leaves. Now, I want you to see that this is not all about money. All right? But it's really all about gifts. See, God has given you and me some amazing opportunities in life and some amazing gifts. I want you to think about that today because a lot of people have been really, I think, emphasizing so much what is wrong in the world. And there's a lot of things happening in the world today. But I want you to think about the goodness of God for just a moment and, and the blessings that he has put in your life. Just like these people in this story, God has given you gifts. He's given you abilities. He's given you resources. He has given you opportunities. Every good and perfect gift that you and I have, the Bible says, comes from the father of the heavenly lights. He doesn't change like shifting shadows but he gives us every good and perfect gift. And he's given you many gifts. You know what a gift is? A gift is what you've been given that you did not earn. God just gives it to you. I want you to see today in your life that God has given you many blessings, all right? One of the blessings he's given us is the opportunity to live in this great country and the opportunities we have here. He's given to me. My wife actually last week on Father's Day gave me a tremendous gift. She gave me a new pair of tennis shoes and I was overjoyed you know, a gift is what you've been given that you didn't earn. Somebody just gives it to you. And God has given us so many gifts. The question is this, in this story or in your life, what are you gonna do with what God has given to you? Let me, let me just ask that question again. What are you gonna do with the gifts and the opportunities and the resources that God has given to you. What are you going to do with it? Because I'll tell you, a lot of people here have a deposit that has never been developed. That's what this story is demonstrating. God has given us gifts. We have a lot of gifted people in this church. And a couple weeks ago, we had a group of men sing for Father's Day. I feel good was the name of the song. If you haven't seen that on our YouTube channel, you got to dial that in and watch that because it's amazing. And they asked me if I would sing on it with them. Well, my voice was so tired from preaching that I was able to sing a little bit, you know, and I was able to kind of get this thing out. But when I listened to that video, it's incredible, the giftedness of the people in our church, the singing gifts. See, we all have different gifts. Romans 12 tells us every single one of us has gifts. I have a friend that has a gift for business. That's incredible. I mean, whatever this person seems to touch, it just seems to be blessed because they have such a gift for business. You could take everything away from this person. They'd probably be a millionaire again in a couple years because they just have a gift. And listen, God has given you gifts in your life. And the question is, what are we going to do with those gifts? In this season right now, as, as difficult of a season as it is, what will you do with the gifts and opportunities that God has given to you. Let's read on and see what these men do. It says this in verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents, what did he do? He went and traded with them and he made another five talents. He took what Jesus had given him and he maximized it, right? And likewise, he who had received two talents gained two more also. These guys both, they, you know, they, they actually got 100% return on the investment that, that he, they had been given. We have three people. We have three levels. We have three giftings. We have three abilities. Everybody's gifts are different. Everybody's abilities are different, right? We're not all given the same thing. That's what this demonstrates to us. But he gives to each of them what he gives to each of us. And that is this, listen, an opportunity. And in this season, I believe we have as people, as God's people and as the church been given an amazing opportunity. What are you gonna do with the gifts and the opportunities that God has given to you? What are we gonna do with it? Listen, you know, what we realize from this parable is that God does not do it all for you. You realize that? I see people, they say, I'm just waiting for God to do something Maybe God's waiting for you to do something. Maybe he's waiting for you to step out there. And I'll tell you something, we've been through a hard season and yes, it has been hard, but the truth is we're still alive. 
The truth is we are still here and we have one life. We have one opportunity. And what are we going to do with that opportunity in your life and in our church? What are we going to do with this opportunity right now? Listen, are you growing today? Are you growing in your relationship with God or are you just stagnant in your relationship with God? I've been around the church for a long time and I'm not talking about our church here, New Life. I love the people of our church and the godliness and the faithfulness of our people. But I am alarmed at the number of Christians, people who proclaim Jesus, who really don't want to do anything. Many times they talk about it. Many times they complain about it. But they never really do it. And that's what Jesus is driving at right here. That's the purpose of this parable. God has given you gifts. You know, sometimes when you receive a gift, much to my dismay, there is assembly required. You know what I'm saying? In modern terminology, it's called ready to assemble. I'm not very good at ready to assemble. And what I found is when you get something and it has instructions on how to put it together, what that really is is just one person's opinion, right? I don't need no instructions. I can put it together myself. Years ago, we got this gift for our kids. It was actually a huge like playhouse thing, like a toy house. And it was a log cabin. This thing was incredible. It came in a big box. You had to put it all together. It had a million pieces with it. But the picture on the front of this box was like, this thing is unbelievable. I'll tell you what, it would have been easier to actually build an actual log cabin. And I spent the entirety of the Christmas season trying to put this thing together. My kids are like, when are you going to have this thing done, Dad? I worked for like a week, and I just had the framework up. And I put it together wrong, and I had to take it back apart again and look at the directions. And it took me like a year to put this thing together. It was not easy. And I never, to be honest with you, I never did get it totally together right. right? But I did the very best that, that I could, because sometimes we got to actually put some energy into it. You know, there, there is assembly required. God gives us the gift, but he expects us to do something with it. And it isn't always easy. Sometimes God calls us to do the hard things in life. You know what God, I believe, wants you to do today? Whatever you're doing in life, he wants you to do it with excellence. He wants you to work as if unto the Lord. And he wants you to do it with, with excellence. If you're doing something for God, do it with everything that you have. In fact, actually, in Psalm 6 and verse 9, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent, how excellent is your name in all the earth. There's an excellent God, and he wants to produce excellence in you in everything that you do. Listen, we got to grow what God's given us. Whether we're in a hard season or whether we're in a season of plenty, we have one shot at this. We have one life to live. And I believe God wants us to be diligent in what he's given us to do. You know, I'll tell you something. What I'm doing right now takes a lot of diligence. I, I'm not naturally a person who can just get up and speak in front of a group of people. And there's a lot of people that have a lot more giftedness of, to do this than I do. But I'm going to give it every bit of energy that I have. I'm going to work at it with diligence. All right? These guys took what he had given them and they maximized it. That's what he's showing us here in this parable. But here comes the other guy, the third guy in verse 18. But... Here comes the big but now. But he who had received one, he went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. He didn't do anything with it. He was given an opportunity from Jesus himself and he didn't do anything with it. You know why a lot of times people I think hold back and they don't really maximize what God's given them is many times because of fear. Many times people put us down you know, get negative with us. You can't do that. Many times it's just the enemy, the devil saying, listen, you're in way over your head. You can't do that. It's too much for you. You're too fragile. Other people can, but you can't. These people won't listen to you. I'm telling you, if God gives you something to do in life, he will equip you to do it. And he will give you the strength to do it. If you step out, listen, well, I'm down here getting ready to preach on Sunday morning. Somebody said, are you nervous? I'm always nervous. Every time I'm nervous. And they say, what are you praying for down there? Because they see me down, you know, praying. I'm telling you, I'm praying, God help me today. Because I can't do this in and of myself. But I want to do it for you. You know, I want to give it everything I have for Jesus. Everything 
that you have been given in life, all of your gifts, all of your opportunities, all of your resources come from the hand of God. And the question today is, what are we going to do with it? He left these servants there to be productive. And two of them were productive, but one of them was not. Which one is going to be you in this parable? Which one? If you're a business person, you should run your business with such excellence that people recognize there's something different about you. If you're fixing cars or you're working in a nursing home or you're paving roads or you're cleaning houses or you're working in a hospital or you're teaching or you're homeschooling or whatever you're doing, bring God your very best in every single thing you do and just see what God does. Just see the blessing of God. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. What does an excellent God want to do in you? I believe he wants to bring about excellence in your life. And I'm not saying life's gonna be easy. I'm not saying it's gonna be perfect, but this guy took what Jesus had given him and he buried it in the ground. And here's the deal. You know, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, that's gonna be a joyous day for us. As followers of Christ, what a day, a day unlike any other when Jesus returns. He's gonna come back. It might be when we pass away or it might be when he returns here to earth. But he's coming back. And here's what happens in verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So here he comes back. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, I love this now. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, I, I, I want to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. I love how he prioritizes the faithfulness of the servant. It's really about faithfulness. You're good and you're faithful. You know, it, Psalm 119 describes God in this way. He said his faithfulness endures to all generations. I believe God is looking for in you and me a sense of faithfulness, faithfulness. You know, I, I've really talked to a lot of people in churches right now who are going through a really tough time in churches. And I'm so blessed by our church community here. But I was talking to some, some pastors this week who people are leaving their church because they have to wear a mask in church. Really? And I'm thinking, where is your faithfulness? I'm telling you, friends, there's a blessing in faithfulness. Even when time gets get tough, to be faithful in what God has called you to, to be faithful in your marriage, to be faithful in your job, to be faithful to your family, to be faithful to the people around you, to be faithful to your church community, even when it's not easy. Well done, good and what? Good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There's a blessing that's gonna come in being faithful. And he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him once again, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What talents, what gifts, what opportunities has God given to you? And maybe right now you're going through a season of adversity, but I want to tell you, we have one opportunity to live this life. And this is it right here. What did I do with what God gave me in this life? What did I do with the talents he gave me? What did I do with the kids? What did I do with the wife? What did I do with the house? What did I do with the education? What did I do with the talent and the time that God has given me? I believe someday he's going to ask us, how did you do with it? What did you do with what I gave you? And I believe God is going to say, I don't want excuses. He says, you've been faithful. You've been faithful in the little things. I'm going, to, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. I'm going to make you the ruler over many things. You know, there are people that come into churches and they want to jump right into leadership. Sometimes if you want to be the leader, you've got to start out, you know, with the small mundane tasks. And we had, after, actually a few weeks ago, our youth pastor, Stephen Mikulski, preached here on Sunday morning. Did an absolutely amazing job. This guy preaches the lights out. 
you know? And, and the funny thing was that the next week he was on bathroom assignment. <laughs> he went from preaching to being on the men's bathroom assignment, on cleaning the men's bathroom on Sunday morning. Someone walked in and said, Steve, you must not have done a very good job last week, although he, he preached the paint off the walls because they, they, now they stuck you with bathroom duty. See, the reason that Steve is blessed is because he understands this, this whole process, that you need to be faithful in the little things because when you are, God is gonna continue to give you more and more opportunities. Are you really being faithful? He says, I'm gonna make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well and done, good and faithful servant. I so long to hear those words. You know what I wanna hear God say? I wanna hear him say, well done, good and faithful church. You lived through a pandemic, you know, you lived through a division in your country. You, serve, you continued to be a light, even in the darkness. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful church as well. Now, I'll tell you something. This guy was not faithful. He, he was not faithful. And eventually, he has to come face to face with Jesus. This is, this is kind of the scary part of this parable. It says this in verse 24, and the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, and he says this to Jesus, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. You know what we tend to do in life? I would tell you because I've done this. We tend to blame other people for our shortcomings. He really didn't do it, but he said, you know, basically, I knew you to be a hard man. The truth is this, he really didn't know Jesus. He really didn't see the real Jesus. He said, I knew you to be a hard man. I didn't realize how compassionate and loving and filled with grace you were. This guy really did not evidently know Jesus. And he says in verse 25, and I was afraid. He had fear. And many times we have fear. And because he was afraid, he went away and he hid your talent. He did the talent in the ground, in the ground. See, you have what is yours. He buried what Jesus had given him in the ground. But many times we do that same thing. That, that's always the risk. What are we gonna do with what Jesus has given us? Right now, church, in this moment, what are you gonna do with what Jesus, this guy buried his talent and he exposed his fear. You know, the, the, the most frequent commandment in all the Bible is fear not. Do not be afraid because when we fear, it holds us back. Do not be afraid. God did not give you a spirit of, pe of fear. Power, love, and of a sound mind is what he has given you. So this guy buries his talent and he exposes his fear. But to be a follower of Christ is something different. It's something more. With Christ, we bury our fear because we know that he's with us. There's no need to fear. We bury our fear and we expose our talent, the opportunities, the gifts that he has given to. We have to put our fear behind us. We have to bury the fear and we got to live out what God has called us to. You know what? One of the determining factors in doing great things for God in your life and in our church, I would tell you is sometimes you have to do it scared. Sometimes you may be apprehensive. You'd have to step out in faith anyway. Sometimes you may be reluctant because of what people say or what they might think, but you have to step out and do it anyway. We had a, an event here in our church that I didn't even really organize, but other people did. And it, we call it, it's our round table. It's our hope and healing round table. And we invited people in leadership, even represented from the, from the federal government, sat here in our sanctuary, uh, we had people that were leaders locally and regionally and law enforcement and other pastors. And man, these are a bunch of learned, excellent leaders here in our community. And we came into this and I was asked to kind of be the MC for this whole thing. And, you know, I was kind of reluctant about it. I would just confess to you because we're living in a community, we're living in a world right now that needs a lot of hope, needs a lot of healing. And the objective of this whole thing was how do we move together into the future in unity? And so I came into this like, I hope this goes well, but God, I think this is what you're calling us to do. We're just gonna step out. We're just gonna do it. Sometimes that's the way we have to live. We just need to step out and do what God has called us to do. And we had this thing here this past week. I'm gonna tell you something. It was amazing. And we're gonna meet again here in three weeks. I was blessed just, 
I was humbled just to be a part of it. And you know what was amazing about this gathering, even though it was a few pastors, it was mainly like civic leaders, like secular leaders. And yet the issue of faith kept coming up, talking about God and where we're, where we're going in the future and how we're going to move together in unity. And I was so encouraged by it. Sometimes, even though we might be reluctant or we might even be scared, sometimes we just need to step out if God's calling us to something. Maybe you're at a place in life like I was from, for a long time where I feel like I've never really grown anything in my life. I've never really stepped out and really, listen, it is not the end of the story. If you're still hearing my voice, you still have life, you still have opportunity. What are you gonna do with the talent, the opportunity, the resources that God has given you? You know, it's, maybe it's time to bury your fear and really use your gift for God. Right now is the test because Jesus is gonna know, wanna know, what, what did you do with it? What did you do with the opportunity I gave you? Let me read the rest of this. This is the tough part of this parable. It, Jesus says this, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. That is not something you wanna hear from Jesus. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. So in other words, he never did anything with it. He never used it. He, he never really did what God was calling him to do. And so he lost the opportunity. Eventually, the opportunity slipped through his fingers. And it says in verse 29, for everyone who has, more will be given. There's gonna be a blessing if we answer the calling of God and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, if you don't use what God's given you, you're gonna lose the opportunity and he's gonna be cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, that sounds so tough. And it sounds in some ways, from my earthly perspective, harsh. But I want you to know that the generosity of God gave this person an opportunity and he didn't do anything with it. What are we doing today with the opportunities that God has laid before us? What are we doing with the opportunities to minister to those people in our own family, our grandchildren, our children? Maybe people who are sitting in a nursing home that don't have anyone else to visit them on this holiday weekend. What are we doing with people who's lo who've lost a loved one? What are we doing to change our community? What are we doing to reach out in the name of Jesus? And it might be something small. It might start with something very, one, one conversation, one phone call, one encouragement. God gives us a choice to take what he's given to us and maximize it. So let me bring this right back to us here right now. Which one of these servants are we going to be? Are we going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in what I have called you to do. Are we going to be that? I hope we are. I hope we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful church. You've been faithful in what I've called. I hope we're going to hear that one day. And this 4th of July weekend, I just want you to think about this. All the blessings, all the gifts, all the opportunities that God has given to you in spite of the days in which we are living, that you and I, as the church of Christ, we are the light of the world. And I believe God wants us to shine his light now as never before. And will we, will you seize that opportunity? right now. Would you pray with me as we bow together, God, I want to pray that you would give us just a vision for what you want us to do in our lives, the places you want us to go in the name of Jesus, the mountains you want us to climb, the, the, the excellence that you want us to achieve. And God, it might not be easy and it might not always be as successful as we want it to be, but God, we want to be faithful to what you've called us to as people, as a, a church, God that you would give us something to do with our lives that really maximizes uh, the, the impact that we have for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God. And I pray that we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. I pray that for each person here today. And I pray in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. And may God bless you, be safe, be joyful on this 4th of July weekend. See you soon.